What does it take to prioritize nature over humanity? Let's talk about it today with a white heron by Sarah Orne Jewett. Sylvia has no problem making this choice and picks the good option over money? Well, let's let's put it this way. I was actually reading an article from the Library of America, and it was talking about how she actually got, I mean, this isn't that crazy of a story to be rejected, right? Like, how many times do you hear about great literature that quote-unquote gets rejected by publishers? But what's interesting is that this was rejected because it was too romantic, right? We're trying to get realistic at the time that this was written, and this is just, I think— and with, with what readers wanted at the time, it wasn't resonating on a level because it was idealizing perhaps nature too much. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, right? Because as we go through history, you look at the Wild West, very much romanticized, and then you enter into the Roaring Twenties and World War I. Everything is dark and dreary and very, very realistic. So it goes through those periods, and this is one of those time periods in history where people wanted gritty, not things that are, you know, aww, ooh, mm, gooey. Well, some people wanted it, right? The story did well enough. We got nine-year-old Sylvie, and I think a nine-year-old leads well to imagination, right? And... You kind of get this like year kickback story. And I'm going to ask you like, what, what did you think about that? Like, Hey, a year ago, my grandma came to ask me to live on the farm and she kind of left, like, I'm going to call it like a Charles Dickens like setup, right? She's in the city sharing space with all her like family and brothers and sisters uh, only to go out to the country with just her grandma and to be given the responsibility of the cow. How did you take that? For me, as a historian, I thought it very unique and odd because a lot of times through history, we saw the inverse happen. On farms, women were not treated very well, usually subjugated almost as second-class citizens. They were relegated to some of the worst jobs, the, the least glamorous jobs on a farm. Not that there were really anything that was better other than the other, but to them, they felt demeaned, and they very much were so. And so for them, they went from the countryside to the city and they went to work in the factories because they got to earn their own money. They got to make their own choices. And the big thing is they got to choose who they married. They weren't forced into marrying the you know third cousin on the farm over. They got to go to the city, make their own money, make their own family, have their husband who they loved, not just were forced into. And in this story, we see almost the inverse of that. Sylvia has more connection to nature and, and animals, and we see her leave the city for the countryside. And I thought that was kind of a cool little twist. Yeah, Sylvie definitely has a connection and you know, she's given I'm going to call like the first real world responsibility. You know, you can view it as earthly or worldly responsibility or duty. You know, this cow, right? Her job is to go out and get this grass-fed cow, bring it back each day for grandma for milking, and she goes into the and I quote dark forest where she stumbles upon a man with a gun. And uh, I, I thought this story was going to go a very different route, but clearly we have what ultimately is Sylvie, who in my opinion represents kind of like this innocence, finally interacting with more of like a, an adult in an, in an independent situation, right? Like this is the first time we're in what I would call twilight. Like, I don't know if we call it coming of age, but she's presented with this man that, you know, she thought was handsome. Out in, the, out in the loneliness of the woods, of the dark forest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Sylvia is the epitome of innocence. She is uh, youthful. She has her naivete about how the world really works because she's honed in on just the animals since she's left the city. And this is kind of her first connection, I think, maybe outside of, you know, nature and her grandmother. This young man who obviously has an impression on her, he's very handsome, he's very polite, and, uh, you know, it kind of gives her those butterflies in her stomach and she doesn't know what to do with herself. And I think that that's exciting for her. And we start to see the story kind of convert from this, uh, you know, simple time in her life towards moving onward to a more mature time in her life where maybe she starts to like boys. Is is ornithologist the right word? He's an ornithologist, right? Like he's studying birds. I don't know if that's the right term, but he's shooting them <laughs> and stuffing them. Right. And he tells them this <laughs> yeah, and not studying uh, shooting. Yeah. So this man, I don't know. He's one way to look at it is he's tempting her with, with worldly things as well. Right. Like I'll give anyone $10 who can lead me to this white heron. I'm looking for this white heron. And 
to me, the grandma is usually like a, a, a symbol of guidance and she's very quick to invite this man in. Like she doesn't sense danger, but my alarms were going off like crazy. And I think Sylvia had some walls up too, because she didn't immediately answer, I think, and say, come back to my house and such. Like uh, there was some apprehension there, but you know, we get, we get guidance from the grandma that we can kind of trust this guy. We start to kind of think that he's handsome. And I think it's when, when we see the, the draw into, so let's, let's do the call back to the city. When you're in a city in the hustle bustle of the city, a lot of times you can get wrapped up in things, right? Wrapped up in the keeping up with the Joneses, wearing the latest clothes, having the nicest snowmobile sort of thing, right? But in the country, as you, you know, aptly stated, you're more connected with nature a lot of times. Like, what do I actually need and what do I enjoy? And I think this is, you know, the man's coming along and presenting some opportunity to get caught up with the money, to be chasing that sort of thing, something that we all need. And instead she goes up to, what was it? A pine tree. I think she climbed to look for this heron. Yep. Cause, cause she's got to yep. see him. And that's when she sees the heron. She sees that, uh, it has a mate as well. So it wouldn't be just affecting that heron's life. It would be affecting the mate, you know, a family potentially. And I've seen some critics even kind of criticize this story from like a, I'm gonna say Eastern philosophy, you know, like you have worldly draws and pleasures in terms of the money, in terms of the city and stuff like that. And she ascends to enlightenment, heaven, like climbing this pine tree, whatever your worldview is. She she reaches above these things and gets a, a view of nature, like like almost kind of like this divine view. And it's her epiphany or her enlightenment, whatever you want to call it. And she has to make the choice now of, do I sell out nature of this bird that's just going about its life, enjoying things with a family, for worldly desires of money where I could use that potentially to help grandma or to buy things that I need. It's it's a situation that I think a lot of people might find themselves in in some regard in terms of the nature versus the humanity argument. There's a lot of different places we can go with it. If you think of Sylvia is leery, she, she knows the alien nature of the city man coming in out to hunt and his desires. And when she reluctantly as you said takes him back to her house and but the grandmother you know is very accepting because she sees his maybe bravado she sees his money and then he offers up the money and maybe that's the difference between youth and age is the grandmother sees the necessity of this she sees that hey we have an opportunity here to better ourselves through this guy and sylvia doesn't you know she she is naive and she sees kind of those, you know, hopeful ideas as she climbs the tree, has her epiphany. Hey, life is worth more than money. And sometimes when you don't think about money as a child, that's true. But the grandmother who has to support this child and their family, she's more practical. And that is, I think that's okay. That's just, that's different, you know, points in your life. You're going to think that money is different to you. When you're really, really old, money is worthless. All you care about is time with your family. When you're really, really young, money is worthless because you don't understand the gravity of your situation of how it is a necessity. And and that is the dichotomy of Sylvia and her grandmother. Oh, that's kind of interesting. I've never really thought about life where you start out without those, those responsibilities of, of money and taking care of yourself and others. And same thing when you're older, ideally, again, it's a generalization. Not everybody is blessed. Some people have a tougher old life, but you know, one way that we view older life is that you do have the resources to kind of the, like you said, treasure each moment with your grandkids, your kids, stuff like that. It's kind of interesting that the in-between is the, the people caught up in the, in the world, like the, like the Dickensian idea of being caught up with the Joneses and chasing the greed and that sort of thing, taking advantage of others for your own personal gain. I never really thought about it that way, that in this story, you've got Sylvie, who's nine, and the grandma, who's past that age, that you have two people <laughs> outside of that, right? Like, I, I'm going to call her in Twilight. Like, she's, she's almost choosing innocence at the end here by keeping the bird secret as opposed to selling it out. I think it fits with that animal nature of Sylvia. She feels more connected to animals than humans. Humans invented money. As so many people have pointed out, we are the only animal on this planet 
that pay to live here. <laughs> and Sylvia is kind of the epitome. She's the embodiment of not having to do that. And I think that's really, really cool. And for me, that was kind of the takeaway of the story is that maybe if we were closer connected to nature, we could live better with nature. Mm -hmm. Well, I think she puts value in it too, right? Because she even questions the man like, why would you want to kill and stuff something you love so much? Like something you're chasing yeah. and cherishing. Why would you just discard it just to display it? Like that doesn't make any sense to her. Yeah, for sure. I guess there's this balance between the relationship of what you love and what you're obsessed with. And the man, he's obsessed with these birds. He doesn't love them because you wouldn't kill something you love. Yeah. Well, we'll leave a playlist to other Sarah Orne Jewett talks down below in a playlist. What did you think of this story? Let us know in the comments down below. And also, should we read more from this author? Let us know what's the next story to check out. My name has been Una. Peace. Peace. <laughs>